Welcome to uh, the next in our uh, Palestine Library events organized here at Columbia University by the Center for Palestine Studies. Uh, my name is Brian Boyd. I'm co-director of the center along with my colleague Nadia Abu al -Hajj. Uh, Today we have in Palestine Library, it's a great pleasure to have with us Dr. Leila Farsah, and we will be discussing with Professor Tim Mitchell her uh, recently published edited volume Rethinking Statehood in Palestine, Self-Determination and Decolonization Beyond Partition, which was published by Cal University of California Press uh, just in October uh, of last year, 2021. Dr. Leila Farsakh is Chair and Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. She holds a PhD from the University of London and an MPhil from the University of Cambridge in the UK. Uh, as well as the book we're discussing today, Leila is also author of Palestinian Labour Migration to Israel, Labour Land and Occupation, second edition 2012, Routledge, uh, and co-editor of The Arab and Jewish Questions, Geographies of Engagement in Palestine and Beyond, Columbia University Press 2020. She's also written widely on the political economy of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and on the one-state solution in a huge number of academic journals, including uh, Middle East Journal, Journal of Palestine Studies, Le Monde Diplomatique, and, uh, and so on. She's also worked with a number of international organizations, including the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development in Paris, and was Senior Research Fellow at Birzeit University. In 2001, Dr. Farsakh won the Peace and Justice Award from the Cambridge Peace Commission in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So uh, welcome, Dr. Farsakh. Professor Timothy Mitchell. Tim is the William B. Ransford Professor of Middle Eastern, South Asian and African Studies at Columbia. He's a political theorist and historian. He holds a PhD in politics and Near Eastern Studies from Princeton University. His areas of research include the place of colonialism in the making of modernity, the material and technical politics of the Middle East, and the role of economics and other forms of expert knowledge in the government of collective life. Much of his current work is concerned with ways of thinking about politics that allow material and technical things more weight than they are given in conventional political theory. Tim is the author of Colonizing Egypt, a study of the emergence of modern modes of government in the colonial period. Um, his subsequent work covered a variety of topics in political theory and the contemporary material politics of the Middle East, and he's published widely on the theory of the state and other topics in political theory. In the, in the field of Middle East politics, he's published a number of essays on agrarian transformation, economic reform, and the politics of development, mostly drawing on his continuing research in Egypt. So uh, again, welcome Tim, welcome Leila, and I will hand things over uh, to Leila, who's going to speak for maybe 25 minutes, 30 minutes. Tim will then respond, and then we'll open uh, the floor, the virtual floor, uh, for questions for the last 15 minutes. We have a hard close at 2 p.m. just to keep you uh, abreast of that. Uh, if you have questions, please put them in the Q and A, not in the chat, in the Q and A, okay? Uh, and with that, I'll hand over to Leila. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me and for this um, wonderful opportunity to talk about my book, Rethinking Statehood in Palestine. This is a book that seeks to re-examine Palestinian attempt to fulfill the right of self-determination through the creation of the Palestinian state. It includes a total of 12 chapters in which mainly Palestinian scholars explore, explore the imperatives and challenges involved in articulating any viable political alternative to the present political impasse that the Palestinian question finds, finds itself in, despite the years of failed peace process. As you all know, the quest for a Palestinian state has been at the center of the Palestinian struggle for a very long time. Ever since the PLO defined its goal in 1971, the establishment of a democratic state, and I quote here, inclusive of Muslim, Christian, and Jews in Palestine, free from Zionist imperialism. Close quote. The establishment of a Palestinian state was considered the means by which Palestinians can ensure the return to their land and establish their national sovereignty. However, the continuous attacks on the Palestinian national movement in the 1970s and 80s 
and its inability to feed Zionism has led the PLO to accept the international consensus on the two-state solution, one enshrined in new and resolution 181 of 1947 as the only option to fulfill Palestinian rights. In 1988, the PLO chairman at the time, Yasser Arafat, officially recognized Israel and the Palestinian National Council, the parliament of the PLO at the time, issued the Declaration of Independence. This in turn paved the way for the Oslo peace process and implied that the Palestinian state was to be confined to the West Bank and Gaza. And indeed by 2022, this, the state of Palestine, has been officially recognized by 130 states and been admitted into the UN as a non-member state. The Palestinian state though is still under occupation and is far from being sovereign or free, let alone capable of protecting Palestinian rights. As many have argued, the Oslo peace process reformulated rather than ended Zionist colonization and thereby undermined the possibility of a viable Palestinian state. Israel continuous war and siege on Gaza for the past 14 years the presence of over 650,000 settlers, Jewish settlers in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, the 703 kilometer long separation wall, and the institutionalization of Israeli checkpoints have destroyed the viability of the Palestinian state and with it the two state solution. And yet, the Palestinian Authority, Hamas, and the international community remain committed to the idea of Palestinian national independence. The Arab Initiative and the internationally sponsored Court Roadmap to Peace in 2002-2003 considered the creation of a Palestinian state not only a necessity, but also the only means to end the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So the question that this book poses and tries to answer are two. First, why is this attachment to the Palestinian state when it failed to meet Palestinian needs and rights? The state that has been declared in the West Bank and Gaza excludes the refugees, excludes the Palestinians as well as Israel, has fragmented the Palestinian nation, and at the same time has compromised the political or citizenship rights of those living in the West Bank and Gaza, given the corruption and authoritarian uh, dimension of the Palestinian Authority. Secondly, the question that this book explores is what are the alternatives to the Palestinian state project? And it tries to look at this alternative by analyzing the opportunities and costs of moving away from the pursuit of territorial sovereignty as a mean to achieve political liberation. And here what I do is really explore in this talk, what I would like to do is to explore two issues. One, the extent to which the Palestinian cause can survive and Palestinian rights be protected without having a state. And secondly, I argue that the failure of the Palestinian state project requires us to re-articulate the relationship between self-determination and decolonization away from the partition model and the two-state solution. Uh, such articulation requires that we transcend the two-state solution that has dominated all international attempts to solve the Israeli-Palestinian question. It also entails that we need to define the elements of a political alternative that is democratic, viable, and economically feasible. So to come to the first question, why are we still attached to a Palestinian state despite the failure of the state to deliver sovereignty or independence, let alone protect Palestinian rights. And this is where the first part of the book tries to shed new light. On the one hand, we have the realist argument, the real political argument, the one that argues that given the international recognition of Palestinian right to self-determination and statehood, why give it up? Many further maintain that in view of the international consensus on partition and the two-state solution, Given the reality of Israel's power militarily and economically, and regionally now, the two-state solution and the Palestinian state is the only option available. For these realists, the issue is how to reform the Palestinian Authority rather than destroy the Palestinian state project. To understand this argument, though, it is necessary to analyze the political economy of the state, the Palestinian state project, something that the chapter by Adam Haniya in this book goes into. As Adam Haniya pointedly shows in this book, we need to understand who stands to gain and lose from the Palestinian project, not only at the Palestinian level, but also at the regional and global level. The Palestinian state project has been sustained despite its failure politically, because it's been financed by Palestinians and other capitalists who made their money in the Gulf and have an interest in perpetuating this project. The future and the sustainability of the Palestinian state project is tied to regional capital and how it is changing or, or not, as we've seen most recently with the accords or with now the meeting between uh, 
in Sharm el Sheikh between Bennett, um, uh, the Emiratis, and um, I believe the Egyptians. So, just as unpacking the political economy of the state is essential to understanding the persistence of the Palestinian state, I argue that the reason why we remain attached, attached to it lies in the fact that it affirms Palestinian right to self-determination. And thus it affirms their political presence, especially given the peace framework that has started off negating their very existence as UN Resolution 242. This might seem trivial today, but it was not so in the 1960s or 70s. As you know, UN Resolution 242, which formed the basis of every peace settlement between Israel and its fighting parties since 1967, does not mention the Palestinians or any of their rights. It just refers to them as refugees in need of a humanitarian solution without mentioning UN Resolution 194, which protects the right of the refugees, or UN Resolution 181. The international recognition of the Palestinian state thus, even within the framework of Oslo and partition, became de facto the only way by which Palestinians can affirm their rights to have rights, as Arendt would argue. It is a necessary, if not a sufficient step, to fulfilling to acknowledging Palestinian political rights, including the right to citizenship, safety, and equality in an international system that is based on the sovereignty of nation states. However, as we explained, this state could not deliver Palestinian independence and actually compromised it as various chapters in this part, in the first part of the book show. Like whether we are looking at the situation in Jerusalem as a chapter by Han Hanya Asali explains, or the um, situation in Gaza as Tarek Bokoni's uh, chapter succinctly asked. The reason for the failure of the state project to protect Palestinian rights, both at the micro level, as the chapter of Asali demonstrates, and at the macro level, as the chapter by Tarek Bokoni, stems from two main factors. First, this failure stems from the fact that it, the Palestinian state project was based on a peace process that was based on partition and confined to a Westphalian understanding of sovereignty, one which remains fundamentally based on an imperial structure of domination. It did not rely on concept of justice and equality that sought to remake the world into a more just place rather than acknowledge the reality of a Westphalian world based on European understanding of statehood and nation states. Secondly, the Palestinian state project in the West Bank and Gaza failed because it was based on de facto accepting Zionism rather than trying to dismantle its colonial structure because of reality. In other words, the Palestinian leadership accepted to forego the question of colonialism rather than undo it Despite UN Resolution 1514 of 1960, that already declared colonialism as a crime and recognized the right of colonized people to fight against it. The Palestinian Authority, the Palestinian leadership accepted or, so, or sought to create a state, a state on top of an ongoing and expanding colonial structure rather than attempt to decolonize the land. It was thus bound to fail to stop Israeli settlement to stop Israelis' infringement on the Palestinian people and de facto lead to the fragmentation of the Palestinian cause, the Palestinian nation. The question then becomes, what should we do? Should the state be destroyed and rejected? And can the Palestinian cause and Palestinian rights survive and be protected without the state? Undoubtedly, the Palestinian cause exists without the Palestinian state. It has always been a struggle for justice, equality, and rights including the right of return as the chapter of Susan Ackman explains. It concerned those who are inside Palestine as much as those outside Palestine, because it's a struggle about indigenous unalienable rights as the chapter of Maha Nassar and Ilan Tape discuss. This being said, I believe that the debate about the Palestinian nation being larger and more important than the state leads us nowhere and does not solve the problem of how to tackle the ongoing reality of settler colonialism or how to protect Palestinian political rights, both inside and outside the boundary of historic Palestine. The question in my view is not whether the Palestinian nation is larger than the state or not. Uh, the question rather is not whether the state should be transcended, but rather what kind of state or legal political structure is needed to end Palestinian dispossession and decolonize the ongoing 
in my view, the Palestinian state's project in the West Bank and Gaza fulfilled its historic role. Its role was to affirm Palestinian political existence as a political entity needing, having political rights. But it could not have provided the liberation and independence that originally its uh, founders or its proponents hoped because it dealt with, did not deal with the colonial structure on hand. So here comes the second part of the book. And here in this part of the book, we explore the kind of knowledge and political strategies needed to de decolonize the present reality and go outside or beyond the paradigm of tradition. Now, there has been a long debate on, and is still ongoing, on the merits and limitations of the one state solution, whether Palestinians should opt for a binational state or reformulate the one state slogan of the 1971. The book goes in some parts about addressing the origins of the one state ideas and the challenging facing the various models, whether it is a binational or secular democratic. However, the main focus of the second book and it's, uh, is to identify the key challenges that need to be confronted in any attempt to transform the ongoing one state reality that Israel created, this apartheid reality, into a political structure or a polity that ensures political rights to the Palestinians. And here it focuses on four conceptual or political issues that need to be addressed in any viable alternative to the present. First, we need to re-articulate the relationship between the nation and the state by moving away from the strict jacket of the nation state, if not rejecting it completely. I think it's about time that we reject the notion of the nation state as the talos of national liberation, given how exclusive and restrictive it has been. Many view the nation as, an exclusive, as, a, as a more inclusive term and one much more cherished than the state, but I am very weary of reifying the concept of the nation while being fully aware of its importance as a concept capable of protecting the notion of collective political rights. I think the real challenge facing us moving forward is how not to reify the concept of the nation and accept that the nation and the state are both historically constituted and politically elastic. One way of dealing with this challenge of what is the relationship between nation and state or self-determination and statehood is to do one of do these three things. First is that we need to define the nation in juridical rather than in ethnic terms. The chapter of Susan Akrab in, in this book is particularly insightful for showing how international law actually affirms the existence of a Palestinian nationality, one created in 1922, but all shows that the uh, international law does not accept the notion of the Jewish nationality. It would accept the question of the Israeli nationality, but there is no such thing as an Israeli nationality today. We have Jewish nationality and Israeli citizenship. In other words, we need to focus the concept of nationality based uh, and the citizenship it accrues on the basis of residency, not on the basis of ethnicities. So the question becomes, how can we use international law to protect the notion of equal citizenship and de-ethnicize political identity. This is the key challenge, but it's not only a challenge facing the Palestinians, it's facing also many other people. Secondly, I think we need to assert the juridical legal dimension of the state rather than its ethical, ethnic dimension. We need to remember that the state is, is and should be a juridical legal order or structure that is held accountable to its citizens, not an ethical order that prioritizes one group for them. This means that we need then to start a debate on the constituent, constitutive, deliberative element of the state, or what would be the constitutional form of the state moving forward. Whether the state is going to be binational or federal or not, this outcome of what kind of state, democratic state, we, we need to have is a conversation that needs to happen. And it needed to happen in deliberation with all those who are living on the land and claim right to the land, so long as it is based on the equality of everybody. The second question that needs to be addressed then becomes, how do we decolonize the present apartheid reality? And what do we mean by decolonization? Decolonization has often meant the decolonization of the land. But decolonization means more than simply decolonizing the land. But if this focus on the state or the nation state, the focus has been once we de decolonize or we liberate the land, we're going to be liber liberated. It's clear this is not the case. Decolonization is a process and not an end. It requires decolonizing relationships and not just the land. It entails 
internal decolonization, as Fanon already reminded us, as well as decolonizing power relationship of the enemy. Some of this chapter in this book talk about decolonizing Israel from within by emphasizing Palestinian indigeneity. This is truly one approach, but it's not the only one. One, both international law and a serious attempt to try and, and think of decolonization as a process that requires decolonizing, decolonizing relationship is something that I be very important. And this, of course, touches on the third very important issues, that any conversation of a one state or of an alternative to the apartheid reality would require us to think of the state as a juridical, legal order constructed through deliberation. It's going to fundamentally require us that we talk about the right of the those who are not Palestinians. This means that as Palestinians, we need to address the question of Zionism and Israelis. How to decolonize Israel without depriving the Jews or Israelis of the right to be equal to the Palestinians. This means that we need to deal with issues of history, national trauma, transitional justice, and accepting what Mamdani would say, that we are survivor of colonialism rather than either native or settlers. This means confronting the enemy, as well as accepting that the enemy is part of who we are and who is on the land. And this is indeed a very difficult question for the Palestinians. And this is that Palestinians have resisted for very long because both it is an unfair question to address and yet it is an inevitable question to address. Mm -hmm. But I would say that this is a question that pertains not only to the Palestinians, but actually to everyone in the region. The question of how do we live with the other? What are the rights of the others? is as just present in Palestine, Israel, today, as it is present in Syria, in Bahrain, Iraq, Iran, you name it. Namely, how do we protect the right of the others who live within this same space, be they Shia or Sunni, Kurdi or Arab, Assad or anti-Assad? And this means that we cannot address this question without addressing history and a firm being trust with a firm belief in political equality. And then this brings me to the fourth challenge, namely how we, in any attempt to define a political alternative, what will be the political will and strategy we need to do? This includes for the Palestinians deciding what defining their new political project. Should they abandon the state? Should they declare a new state? Should they revive the PLO? Should they create a new organization than the PLO to try to include uh, everybody involved in the conversation? This to me means that the Palestinian citizens of Israel have a very important role to play both because they know both society and both because we are at a historical juncture, I believe, where the Palestinians, the citizens of Israel, hold the key for how we can imagine a new future. All this to say that the road ahead is tough and the questions that we need to address are difficult. This book tried to make it a conversation between and among Palestinians and how we can start to tackle these questions uh, and because there is no escape to them. What is clear is that we cannot transcend the state, but we need to define it its role and its limit by making it accountable to all those who live on the land. Thank you. I'll stop at here and I look forward to hearing uh, your comments. Uh, thank you, Leila. It's, um, it's a great privilege to be given this opportunity to discuss your work with you. I've, I've admired your writings for a long time, um, Brian went through some of them at the beginning, your, your first book on Palestinian labor migration within Israel to Israel from, from the occupied territories that, um, you know, I think in many ways opened up uh, exactly some of the questions that you're now um, confronting from a, from a very different historical moment. Um, and one of your articles that I always liked very much was that one you published in JPS a few years ago on Palestinian on the paradigms of Palestinian economic development, um, showing how the post-67 and particularly post-Oslo um, situation had kind of normalized a certain way of treating, in this case, the Palestinian economy as something that by definition accepted the, the separate status of, of the West Bank as that object of economic development, studying it uh, in a way entirely divorced from um, both the, the, the colonial construction of that uh, West Bank economy, but also of the larger um, regional, not only larger in the sense of um, all of historic Palestine, but also the larger regional 
um, arrangements. And it's interesting how many of those themes from your own earlier work are sort of present in the way you've described in, in this um, in this book. I mean, you've mentioned uh, several of the chapters very briefly. I hope people will be inspired by your summary to, to read the, the, the whole book. Um, uh, for, you know, Adam Hania's chapter, um, I think is, I mean, enormously important for thinking about um, the investment in the Oslo process um, on the part of um, largely Gulf-based or Gulf origin capital in the hands of, of Palestinians. And it's a picture that is quite clear, of course, to anybody who visits the West Bank, but to think through politically the implications of that as Adam does in his chapter. Um, I don't have time to go through the, the individual chapters, but, but um, I, I think uh, Leila's picked out many, if not all of them, and um, given you a sense of the, the richness of, of the book and the range of, of questions. Um, uh, looked at. Let me um, pick up a couple of things more directly from, from, from your own summary just now, though um, some of that is recapitulating, as you've said, many things are in the book, including things in your own chapter. Leila has written the introduction and conclusion, but also has a, has a chapter herself within the book um, addressing these key questions about the very concept of the state and um, uh, the commitments to the state and the forms of the state that um, she argues have to be rethought. Um, and I think it's um, the historical depth of that, both because she goes back in that chapter to, um, uh, to earlier periods, uh, early Zionist um, advocates of binational states and then um, the PLO advocacy of a, of a single democratic state. Um, she goes back to that historical um, uh, archive to think this through, but, but the analysis itself, and I think what's so important is one that's thinking, where are we now? And um, uh, what are the ways post Oslo, post Second Intifada, post um, uh, everything that has happened, the, um, the, the US recognition of the occupation of East Jerusalem and so on um, uh, in recent years. Um, and, and I think the combination of, of the historical depth of the analysis with the awareness of the uniqueness of the situation now is a very important part, not only of Leila's analysis in her own chapter, but, um, but of the book as a whole. I, I suppose um, one implication of what you're saying, and I, I'd be interested to in know um, your thoughts on that, because I think you actually even said this, um, but I just want to draw it out a bit. Um, in where you were summarizing and addressing this thing, that the key challenges um, uh, uh, of, of re-articulating the nation and of uh, decolonizing. One of the things that seemed um, clear is that in some sense, the, the, the current struggle of 48 Palestinians within Israel, or within Israel, uh, within its 48 boundaries, sort of is a way to think about the struggle as a whole uh, on the one hand. Um, because um, those issues of um, uh, how to think about political belonging outside the framework of ethnicity, how to uh, confront and deal with the other um, on an everyday basis are, of course, exactly the, the issues that um, 48 Palestinians have perhaps had to deal with all along and, and perhaps even more intensely today with uh, the intensification of legal changes attempting to marginalize them and um, redefine their status. And I'm curious if you think that particular notion is a useful way of thinking of part of what you're arguing, that there's, there's some way in sort of generalizing from or uh, and also learning from that particular part of the struggle um, for uh, Palestine as a whole, 
um, whether generalizing the sense of looking for initiatives from there or looking for examples or looking for um, uh, lessons and, and, and pitfalls. Um, so, you know, in, in, in that way, part of what you're saying is a kind of focusing down on one aspect of the problem and then trying to expand out from it. But I, I'm equally struck um, uh, from uh, another part of your, your sort of four issues to address. I think that was the first of the issues, really, or that, that thought comes from the first of the issues. Um, uh, in the third one, where you talked about how to um, how to decolonize not only um, uh, Palestinians but also how to decolonize um, Israeli Jews, how to um, think about uh, multiple communities as equally the survivors um, in Namdani's term of colonialism, um, and um, the particular thing you said there was that this is actually the same question that is faced by communities in Syria, in Iraq, in Bahrain, um, and other places where um, forms of internal oppression or violence, while taking a diff very different form from that in Israel, Palestine, can be seen to share that same status of people sharing the, the the consequences of colonialism. And so this is the sort of opposite move. Um, obviously not, not in the same way and not in the form of settler colonialism, but nevertheless, um, rather than sort of focusing in on one particular community within Palestine, trying to get people to think of parallels and to think of solidarities that are, I mean, in, in that sense, that extend um, well beyond it. And of course, those kinds of solidarities have a long history, but, solidarities with the Palestinian struggle. Um, and they've sometimes worked, of course, the other way, solidarities with the Algerian struggle and, and many, many others, um, Lebanese and so on. But is that, uh, but, but you didn't talk about it in those historical terms, you talked about it in the present, and I found that really interesting. And of course, as you say, it's a present in which um, the Emiratis and the Egyptians and, and the Israelis are meeting, um, you know, the whole post Abraham Accords uh, realignment or recognition of an, a long term and existing realignment that has been taking place. And, um, you know, the, the, the common reaction to that realignment is, well, it's, it's just what was always going on and it's just become more explicit. Um, or it's a, a sign of betrayal and so on, which you know may both be true, but there seems to be another thing one can read from that in relation to the previous point I was making, that it actually provides the opportunity to do this sort of redefining of the struggle um, in connection with the struggle of other peoples in the region in a new kind of way, because it's not a struggle um, like the, the days of the Algerian struggle or um, it, it is one that, peoples elsewhere in the region. Again, that seemed to be an implication of what you were saying. Um, and I just want to sort of um, uh, invite you to, to, to comment on it and to, to, to think about. Um, I, I don't want to take too much time because we've got a large audience and there's going to be many questions. So maybe I'll actually just stop there, but mainly again, just to congratulate you on the book and really encourage people to um, to get hold of it and, and and read it and engage with it, but I'll, I'll I'll leave you with those two little questions, and then we'll we'll start taking um, questions from the Q and A. I will not call them little, but thank you very much. <laughs> no, thank you very much for your 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 compliments and you know for liking the book and mentioning my previous work. And you're right. I mean, I actually yeah, this book is about you know what I left in my first book. You know, like because in my first book I I started the work my first book on Palestinian labor migration to Israel, not thinking that I will be aware that it will lead me to the conclusion that there will be no Palestinian state. And it was fascinating because once you see the political economy of it, which people in the 1990s were nobody looking at, is that you realize, my God, they're doing an apartheid without realizing they're doing an apartheid. So, uh, you know, we talked about apartheid now, thank God it's been normalized, but I talked about it already in, in 2003, 2004. So, and with this book, the, really the challenge was, 
that we, we've been talking about this one state solution for the past 20 years, this revival. Ever since, ever since we had the second intifada, people have started talking about we need this is an apartheid reality, we need to have one state, one state. And yet it became it it was difficult to to formalize it. You know, if you only know the number of conferences that happened on the one state since 2006, you know. Right. And this book was an attempt to try and think, okay, what are the challenges that we as Palestinians need to address? Because it's much easier to get Palestinians and Israelis to talk about it, who is gonna sign on. Okay, but I felt that there were some and through my encounter, of course, that there are some fundamental questions that we as Palestinians need to address. And as you mentioned, the chapter in the book where I talk about the historical origins of the one state solution was actually very interesting research I did because it allowed me to see how the early Zionists, the human Zionists imagined by nationalism and justified it. And how the Palestinian one state slogan that many, very few people know of that booklet when they should, and everybody mm -hmm. should read that booklet where you know uh, the PLO makes its case for the, for the one state solution under a pseudonym, pseudonym because they were scared that people would be, because it was blasphemous, blasphemous in the 1970s, as you know, it, to talk about the two-state solution or, you know, or how do you talk about the right of the Jews and all that. So in, in what I try, what this book tries to do and to come to your first question about the role of the Palestinian inside 48 and how they can show us the way and how to connect the local with the regional. It really came by, studying well the Palestinian cause and the trajectory it went in. You know, it just felt if what put us, what put the Palestinian cause on the map are the Palestinian refugee, which created the PLO, okay? Because without the PLO, Arafat, people forget that they hate him, but the people forget that in 1968, he used to go around and say, we are not a bunch of refugees in need of a humanitarian solution. We are a people with the right to self-determination. So they led the movement and they were very important precisely in getting us to the UN. It was the, the struggle of the people in Lebanon and Syria and Jordan that got the Palestinian to the UN in 1974. And we got the acknowledgement, we got the PLO got a seat in, at, at, as an um, um, observer, non member. And with that was the international recognition of the Palestinian rights to self determination, also under the slogan of the one state. So, but then as the realism kicked in and as you're trying to balance between do you do real politique or do you do, do you re remain morally superior, we came to accept also. And people also forget how much in 1988, even those who were against, uh, many people believed, okay, it's not the best solution, but it's a solution. And there was also enthusiasm. There were people really believed in 1990, the state will be something we're gonna have. It's the exact, we thought we're gonna have the Algerian liberation. We, the state is gonna be, provide solution. And as we know, it did not. So I think the juncture we are in is fascinating it's for the past 20 years of, let's think about it. We've been 20 years since the second Intifada, 22 years. In other words, there has been a whole generation who only knew not the Lebanon war, not the first Intifada, only, not even PA only PA under second intifada, which is a particularly difficult condition. So the, the glamour of the state, the glory of what the state is giving is completely lost, okay? People had it in 1990, but they don't have it today. Today is having a state means nothing. It doesn't mean liberation, it means a job. And if it means a job, then it's not what, and, and, and there's no freedom. Then it's the same question facing every Arab citizen, okay? Then, then this becomes, Every Arab citizen is facing the question, okay, I got national independence. What did this bring me? Nothing. What is the Arab uprising? Apart from saying we want dignity and rights as citizens, because the Arab uprisings in 2001 were not 11, were not about toppling the state, was not about turning one, it was about giving us rights. So this is where I saw the connection between the internal, the Palestinian struggle and the regional struggle. Both are struggle of people realizing that the solution is not toppling the state or changing the state in terms of you bring Hamas and then, you know, instead of Arafat or you bring, you know, the Islamists in, in Egypt instead of Sisi or whatever, they are, or the, in Algeria. People are fully aware in the Middle East, I think, that the problem is how you're going to make the institutions of the state accountable, how you're going to institute democratic systems. And especially in the light of the civil wars that happened, especially in Iraq and more so in Syria, I think what I meant by the other Okay, it's not a colonial other, but we're still the nation state, as argued, made out of those who don't belong to what the ruler of the state defined as national to be without rights. So I think what has happened on the regional level, 
it showed again that Palestine is learning from the region and the region is learning from Palestine, which has always been the case, okay? It, I think a positive thing that it made many people feel sad that Palestine now is not the issue. I actually think Palestine is still the issue. And I think it's not true. It's actually very important to think that the catastrophe in Syria is bigger than Palestine. Uh -huh. And the solution to Syria and the solution to Palestine are tied together. And I think the Abraham Accord pointed out how colonialism and authoritarianism collide. They're not separate. We thought that, okay, we can, colonials are worse than authoritarian, we'll, we'll swallow the authoritarians so long as they can help us liberate Palestine or liberate. Today is very clear. The Abraham Accord makes it very clear, and this is the political economy is very important. There are those who benefit from the system of oppression, and there are those who are not benefiting from the system of oppression. And the question is, how you gonna, how are the victim or those whose rights are oppressed find the tools and the political structure or the power structure to assert their presence and their rights. And here what I say comes to the question of the Palestinian citizens of Israel. I think in the book, I made sure not to exclude any Palestinian constituency because they're both related. But if you wanna talk in historical term and political term, it does seem that the Palestinian citizens of Israel today, the, the, the historical juncture of the Palestinian cause if it was led by the refugees in the 1970s, led by those inside the West Bank in the 1990s, today, moving forward, it's gonna be led by the Palestinians inside 48. This doesn't mean that they are the leaders. I'm just saying they show the way precisely, and we saw it in two ways. We saw it during the Unity Intifada last year. The fact that it started in Jerusalem, people again fighting for rights. They did not say state of state. I want my right and my right is to live in my home, whatever it is, it was, it's not just land. And it goes to Gaza, and from Gaza, you will also have all the Palestinian mobilization inside 48. And the Palestinian mobilization 48 was in particularly impressive, and I would say the Zionists were, must have been very scared, because in comparison to 20 years ago, they were not just simply shot at. They were shot at, but they kept fighting, and they know very well how to use the democratic tools that Israel have between two commas, or the tools of the state that, that, that they know how to speak the language and use the tool without being co-opted. And I think that shows again the importance of having how democratic systems, even if they're not fully, even if they're racist, they still can give you some leverage that you can use. But also this does not eliminate the question that also the Palestinians among them need to also revive these democratic representative institutions. There's a, if you go to Palestine today, inside whether it is in Gaza or in the West Bank or inside 48, there's incredible mobilization about how we're going to deal with the power. And there's so much more realism among the young generation about how we need to do politics and politics do it in an intelligent way, how not to be moralistically superior, but actually politically a, a, a creative and principled at the same time. And the way I, I describe it for me, it's the way of think of a puzzle. We are in a puzzle and the various parts of the puzzle it still hasn't coalesced, but at one point it's gonna coalesce and it cannot, because this puzzle of Palestine is part of a larger puzzle in the Middle East because the Middle East is not sustainable. And this crisis of Ukraine, I predict, is gonna show us that we're gonna, it's not gonna, that major changes are gonna happen over the next two, three years. But, so I hope I answered your question. I tried to- No, be that's wonderful. Um, so, so we've got some questions in the Q&A and, &A and um, uh, let me summarize them quickly so that um, you have as much as possible. The first one from um, Leila Abdul Razak. Um, uh, thanking you for the project and talk. I won't read the details because everyone has, can see the same questions, um, but how the refugees fit into the conversation, um, especially uh, with national identity being tied to where you live, um, given that uh, Palestinians are in many ways a largely diasporic people. Um, I mean, do, do you want to go through all the questions and see which you have time um, no. for, or take them one by one? Whichever you prefer. I mean, the refugees, I would just say to that, the refugees are central to the cause. And I didn't try in any way to say that they are marginal. They remain core to the question because the essence of the Palestine question is the refugee question. Just as, so the question is what will be the form of their political participation in a Palestinian project? Today, many people think that their role of participation is through the diaspora, through the, the you know, people in the US or in, in Europe descendant of refugees claiming the rights. I think the refugees have been actually quite creative about how to assert their identity as Palestinians, but also to claim citizenship rights, whatever they can get it. And I think that's important. So I think 
I think moving forward, the refugees remain central to the Palestinian cause. And the, the, if we go to international law, international law protects that right. Uh, the question is how, what will be the new political path, platform in which their voices and their concerns will be heard? And I think I worry that they might become more, I mean, yeah, I'll keep it at that. I'll keep it at that. Okay. Great. So the second one from Moraya is um, how Palestinian transnational feminists have problematized the establishing of a nation state. Is, is, there some, is, is that something in the book or, or alternatively just something you yourself have observed? I mean, it's something, it's a very important question and I think Palestinian feminists have played a very important role in show how the state has been problematic and has been uh, oppressive also of the women, you know. <laughs> the Palestinian state project proved to be uh, like every most many nationalist project compromised women liberation for the sake of the nation and then the nation is neither the nation liberated and the state oppresses the women. So I think their work has been very important in problematizing the pursuit of statehood and also problematizing the problem of patriarchy. And I think in, in the book, unfortunately, I couldn't have a chapter to discuss that dimension. I would have loved to. But I do think uh, Palestinian feminists or feminist, transnational feminism has a lot to show in how you, how, in how to keep the Palestinian question alive, but also how the Palestinian question is transmitted and protected. And also what is the nature of political activism? That what, what kind of future we're gonna have is much, very much tied with what, how do we perceive equality uh, along gender and, and demolished patriarchal structure. Great. Um, so then a question from Nadim, um, thanking you again for the excellent book and talk. Um, Regarding the importance of taking a juridical understanding, um, uh, um, sorry, it's jumping around. Um, we know that Israel continues to contravene international law. Many attempts to hold it accountable have failed. Would you say this is where PCIs would be most powerful, i.e. in strategizing mm -hmm. a new Palestinian political body that challenges Israel legally from within? Um, if not, then who? Yeah, no, I totally I agree. I mean, they, I think every every Palestinian constituency has an has a role to play. The Palestinian citizens of Israel have a very important role to play in exactly instrumentalizing international law and inter instrumentalizing Israeli law to the benefit of the Palestinian cause and on the, on the issue of decolonizing from within, right? Yeah, indigenization, all that. But I I also think there's an you know. That this is you can have multiple strategies. You also have strategies going on in the West Bank, and you have strategies going on in in, 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 in Gaza, and you have strategies in the Palestinian diaspora in the U.S. For example, has been very vocal, has been very successful in keeping the Palestine question alive, in promoting and explaining. I mean, we just had Mesa voting for BDS. This is major. We've been working on it for the past twenty years. It finally happened. So something is moving. But I think what what is important. To for Palestinians, what is lacking right now among the Palestinians is how to have a national debate about what is it that we want. And that's the real challenge. Many people are thinking alike, how you're gonna coalesce it is very difficult. And I believe it's gonna be difficult to coalesce it without either reviving the PLO or having new institutions that talk and represent. I think there are lots of grassroots organizations happening inside within the, the borders of, of, of Palestine, West Bank, Gaza, and Central Asia. The question, do we need a national for, forum or not? And I think at one point we'll need to figure that out, um, so. Great, so then we have a question from uh, Hassan Fauzi. I, is that our own Colombia, Hassan Fauzi? If it is, welcome. Um, uh, dealing with major obstacles facing Palestinian freedom, you skip the fact that Israel is recognized by the UN and by many Arab states as a Jewish state. It's mm -hmm. also the consensus of um, 7.5 million uh, Jewish Israelis. Um, how can um, one discard such a fact and um, uh, 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 in, in what you're arguing? I'm not disregarding it at all. Uh, I just think that this is, we know that this proves that Israel is a racist state. This proves that Israel cannot be Jewish and democratic. Uh, this just shows Israeli fear. Uh, it's not a coincidence that they asked to be recognized as a Jewish state in, in two, after 2000, and they don't ask for it in 1948 or in 1950 or in 1980. 
So I think this is a this is a proof of the crisis that Zionism is facing, and also a proof that uh, of of the that the way we counter it is not to say it's a hopeless case. How can we talk with these people uh, and we need to get rid of them? Is rather how do we enhance our power of Palestinians to be able to counter the racist argument of uh, Israelis? I mean, it's, it's very similar to South Africa. Also, the South African in 1948 were declared an apartheid state and were accepted in the end an apartheid state, and they stayed an apartheid state for, for, 40, for, for 50 years while there was a resistance going on underneath. And the resistance underneath with the ANC was very important in focusing precisely in 1955 that we want a single United States. We want, we are all African. Yeah, we're not white or, or black. And I think, okay, they, were they had the advantage that they were the majority and the whites were the minority. But in Palestine today, in Israel and Palestine, we're equal population. You know, we're talking about 6.5 million Palestinians and 6.5 Jews. Uh, this, this demographic issue is going to haunt Israel forever. The challenge for me is much more the problem that we have the Emirati and the um, Egyptian willing to work with that state at the expense of, uh, of the rights of the Palestinians. But again, this shows that the Palestinian struggle needs to again to become part of the Arab world, just as it was always part of the Arab world. So this synergy or this dialectic, if you want, I, mean, I don't like to using dialectic, although I would have to in that respect. There is, there has always been a synergy between the Palestinian cause and the Arab cause for, for, uh, for freedom. It got suspended in the 1990s with the neoliberal argument. But now that we are shifting in a world which, where the neoliberal argument is really under very serious threat or this challenge, maybe we can finally find a new language in which we can counter racist arguments in a viable political strategy. Okay, so we've got a couple of minutes left. We're only really only time for one question. There's two questions there, a, a follow-up from Rasan Fauzi, but it's actually similar in a way to um, the question by a um, uh, someone joining us from Brazil, um, a sort of general and specific form of the same question. So from Brazil asking whether you think the solutions you pointed to have the support of any of the main political players in Israel, and if so, which ones? Mm -hmm. And then Hassan is, is asking again, um, uh, or, or is, 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 is doubting this argument about whether one can build on the 48, 49 Palestinians as a major power of decolonization, while they're more and more part of Israeli colonial strategies and officially a part of the Israeli government. So sort of two, two versions of a similar question in a way. Well, I mean, you're going to find the collaborators and the rebel, rebellious in each group. You're going to find that among the Palestinians in the West Bank. You're going to find this among the Palestinians inside 48. What matters is, is that that what is the nature of the discourse we're having? If the discourse has shifted from national liberation to political rights, and I think that's important that people talking about equal political rights, this depends on how we're gonna use it effectively for the larger cause. I think we should not, I mean, there's lots of critique of Palestinians participating in the Israeli elections and Israeli government. I totally agree with those criticisms, but it is, an indication of changing times and that there is a presence that, of course, the Israelis will always try to contain, but they can only contain for so long. As I say, the, the real challenge for us Palestinians is how, now that we know the problems we have, I think what it stands for our favor is that we tried the two-state solution and it failed. <laughs> now we are back to square one, but not really to square one because we gained a lot, even if we lost even more. Now the question is how do you define a new viable political democratic platform. And in that respect, I will just remind everybody of the South African example, because I had to study it a lot. They come up with the Freedom Charter in 1955, okay? And they had Bantu stands all the way, which is not very, very similar to our Bantu stand in the West Bank. Very, very similar from 1960 until 1990. But there was lots of grassroots work on the ground until it was the right time that everything coalesced. So we have, each one of us has, their role to play. What is important is that our discourse is the discourse of dignity and rights and equality. And there is an international resonance for that. But there's lots of hard work to be done politically. But at least it's being done today without the nostalgia or uh, the idealization of the previous generation. I feel that's what's, uh, there's not the idea of salvation that people thought the state would provide. And that's promising. It's 
it's not gonna be rosy, but it's gonna be better than what we have today and we won't have our work to do. So uh, I think I'll stop at that. I, I, I think that's a very poignant point on which to stop. And I just want to thank you on behalf of all of the audience for taking the time to, um, to, to tell us about your book. You said at one point that the question now is how to have this national debate. And I'm quite sure this book is gonna be a, a very important part of, of, of exactly that question. Thanks okay. so much. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much for this and great discussions. Bye bye. <laughs>